On this episode of Doing the Most, we are making a very simple Merlot pie mint. Homemade brews and berries are to use everything from meat to roast. Big creation, fermentation, and ebriation, doing the most. I've made a handful of Merlot wine kits over the years, and I've attempted a couple of Merlot pie mints. One was, you know, a Merlot pie mint, a Merlot base with some honey. And then the other was a blend of a Merlot that stalled, so it was very sweet, blended with a mead to kind of make a blended pie mint. Neither did I love. And I haven't really had great success with Merlot kits over the years anyway. Often they stall, but I really wanted to go back to the drawing board particularly because I've a little bit written this off in our Discord server when folks have asked about it. I wanted to go back and revisit the concept and come up with something that worked. But I also wanted it to be something that was a little bit self-balancing and totally simple. The real key to this recipe is using a light-bodied wine kit. That is a wine intended to be brewed to five or six gallons in around the 7% alcohol range. That's because we're gonna add enough honey to this that it's gonna bump it up past 11 or 12% alcohol into the more standard strength range. Using a lighter body kit allows us the cushion, the flexibility to bolster the honey profile in a really strong way and achieve something that complements the grape juice but also still smacks of honey, which is what you want in a mead. Another great thing about using a wine kit for something like this is they are typically pretty well self-balanced. Now, you may find yourself wanting to adjust the acid or the tannin profile a little bit, maybe use some oak to add some more and more interesting tannin to it, but I tend to find that wine kits generally for the average palate are pretty okay in the balance department. In my recipe testing, another thing that was really clutch was mixing honeys. So in this recipe, we use a lot of orange blossom honey and a little bit of buckwheat honey to give you two very polar opposite honey profiles that both play nicely with the Merlot grape. And finally, usually a Merlot is gonna end up pretty much on the dry side, but really to bring some of that honey character back, it needs some back sweetening. And we're doing not a super heavy handed back sweetening, it's only moderate just to take it a little bit past off dry. And for that, one pound of orange blossom honey works pretty well. So all that said, let's take a look at our recipe. The ingredients for our punchy purple Merlot pie mint are a Merlot base from a six gallon light body wine kit four pounds of good orange blossom honey, two pounds of delicious buckwheat honey, and spring water to five gallons. We will be using RC212 red wine yeast for this recipe. For back sweetening, I added one pound of orange blossom honey. So we're gonna get started by placing our honey in our carboy. First, the orange blossom honey goes in. This is coming from a bucket, so I <laughs> refilled halfway through. And then our buckwheat honey goes in. And I get my buckwheat honey from Mill Creek Honey. This is not a paid endorsement. They just have really, really excellent buckwheat honey. Highly, highly recommend it. Buckwheat honey goes right in on top of all that. And this stuff is pretty dense. It's probably thicker than the honey that you're used to. It's got a real molasses kind of character to it. Very, very rich honey. The kit I'm using for today's episode came from Wine Lovers USA. This isn't a paid endorsement, but they do sell light body wine kits, so they're kind of easy to find and affordable there. But you can find wine kits on basically all the major online retailers. But of course, if you can, buy local and support your local home brewing store. And it's time to unbox our Merlot kit. Inside we've got all sorts of goodies including a big old bag of Merlot juice concentrate. This is obviously evaporated down to reduce it for packaging. We're going to rehydrate it by adding that spring water. So let's take a look at what came with this kit. Oak chips, clarifying agents called Kytosan and Kieselsol, stabilizers, potassium sorbate and potassium sulfite, and bentonite, a clarifier that's made out of clay. 
It also came with this nondescript wine yeast, which we're gonna sub in for RC212. That should give us some better color retention and help retain some of those big, bold, fruity wine flavors. So that Merlot base goes right into the funnel. And be very careful when you're pouring these because if this gets on stuff, like that white t-shirt that I'm wearing, it can stain pretty bad. Think about wine stains, but a little bit more concentrated. Be careful, be cautious. And we're gonna go ahead and throw in that bentonite. I don't really ever use bentonite as a clarifier, but I figured while I have it on hand, I might as well yeet it in there and let it do some work in primary. Really important to winemaking is having a good mineral balance in your water because you're not working with straight grape juice here pressed fresh out of wine country. You're working with a concentrate that you end up rehydrating to get up to your fermentation volume. And the water that you choose for that is important. You wouldn't want to use chlorinated water. You wouldn't want to use distilled water and probably you wouldn't want to use tap water. And so for this, I recommend getting something that's nice and mineral balanced like spring water that's bottled for drinking and using that because it's gonna give you a nice kind of nondescript water profile that's not too soft and not too hard. And so it's not gonna jump out at you as something that you notice that takes away from the rest of your mead. Once all our water's in there, we'll get it stir, stir, stirred right up and then clean up. We're gonna use some of this stuff, but we wanna keep all of this stuff. And I really feel like the best way to keep all the wine kit stuff together is to throw it into a zipper bag like this one and just rubber band it around the neck of your carboy. That way it just kind of rides out all of fermentation hanging out next to your wine or your mead. And that way you don't lose it. Hard to see here, but our starting gravity was about 1.112. And time to throw in that red wine yeast. Right on in dry. I did not rehydrate this yeast and that wasn't a problem. I am following a Tazna 2.0 nutrient schedule that is an all Fermaid O nutrient schedule in four staggered nutrient additions starting after the first 24 hours. Now I'm wearing this shirt today because I wanted an important reminder that a staggered nutrient schedule is crucial to achieving a good product with this recipe. Wine kits do have a tendency to stall sometimes because grape juice doesn't necessarily have enough nutrient to get you over the finish line of fermentation. Add to this the complicating factor that we're adding honey, which has no natural yeast nutrient in it, and you're creating a recipe for a stall. So make sure that you calculate your nutrients by using a nutrient calculator. I recommend the batch builder calculator because it's simple and do a staggered nutrient addition schedule and do it by the schedule. Don't start too late, don't end too early. And it is very difficult to see our final gravity here, but it is basically 1.001, right around 1.000, but totally dry. No sweetness left in here at all and a nice thick, firm yeast cake sitting there at the bottom. So it's time to get that racked off into secondary so we can stabilize and back sweeten. Get it transferred right over, and then I'll be adding my potassium metamisulfite and potassium sorbate. So again, I didn't use the stabilizers that came with this. I mixed up my own so that way I knew I had the right amount for my batch size. Those stabilizers could be used at another time for an appropriate batch size, but I just wanted to make sure I had the right amount of stabilizers in here for my five gallon volume. Airlock goes back on and will give that 48 hours to do its job. After 48 hours, we'll pop the top on there and we'll get this back sweetened. And like I said, I'm gonna be back sweetening with one pound of orange blossom honey. And this doesn't take it too high. You're only gonna gain a little bit more density because this is so high alcohol and so thin, adding that much honey doesn't actually change the density of the liquid that much. And realistically, because of how big and bold this piment is, the honey doesn't add an extraordinary amount of sweetness to this either. I find that it's just enough to highlight the honey flavors. Then a few days later, after the honey is mixed in thoroughly and allowed to set a little bit, we will add our clarifiers. We're using the ones that came with the wine kit here, the Kiesel Saw and Kaidazan. You might find this in your local homebrew store labeled as Super Clear or Dual Fine. 
and it's a two-part finding agent. So they're both polarized differently and grab onto things in different ways and help them all precipitate out and sink to the bottom to form a nice solid cake at the bottom that you can rack off of, or in this case, that we're going to bottle off of. That way you don't get any of that stuff carrying over into your bottles. These kits generally come with a lot of stuff you either don't want or don't need or can save for another time. And so it's good to just hold on to all that stuff. This is all the stuff that's left over from me doing this mead. We ended up not using the stabilizer since I was pretty sure that these were for a six gallon batch, not a five gallon batch. Didn't want to add more than we needed. Obviously we replaced the yeast in this with a better yeast and I chose not to use the oak. And generally Merlot kits will come with oak. If you decide you want something a little bit more interesting and complex in there, you might throw in maybe half the bag of oak for a few weeks and see how that treats you. And basically that's it. It's sweetened up, it's microbially stable. It's time to get it in these bottles. And here's one more check on the final gravity. Hard to see there, but it's 1.010 barely above totally dry. And we're just bottling that away in these Bordeaux bottles and we'll be corking this using a hand corker. Got about 20, 21 bottles, I think, out of this batch, so not bad. I have a lot of friends and colleagues and coworkers who are really gonna appreciate the gift of bottles of this because I've got a few batches of it bottled away now. So I suppose we should move on to the tasting. wearing my jammies tonight. All right. Let's taste it. I love a really good like tannic, like mouth sucking tannic Merlot, which are usually pretty hard to find at Oklahoma wineries. Just big, whiny, grapey, fruity essences on the nose. You can pick up just a little bit of honey there in the background too. Like, if you weren't smelling for the honey, you might not be able to detect it, but since you know, since I know this is a piment, I know to look for it. And it's just like big Merlot aromas on the front end and then honey right there at the tail end. So it's got that tannic, almost chalky kind of tannin, that grippy kind of piercing tannin that I really like in a Merlot, while also having just a little bit of heat in there that really kind of warms you from the inside. It's almost what I would call juicy, but it has so much of that big, heavy wine body that you can't really call it that. So on the nose, again, it is wine. It's very distinctly Merlot with just a touch of honey on the tail end. On the palate, it washes down like a Merlot. And as soon as you swallow, you get those pungent points of buckwheat honey sticking up through the middle of your tongue. And then as you exhale, that rich orange blossom zing kind of just kind of waves over your palate. Mm. Tastes like a wine, tastes like a mead. I could see how some people might want this a little bit sweeter to a little bit bring out that honey. But I think for my palate, if it was any sweeter than this, the Merlot would start to get lost a little bit. It's so complex. And it's complex in that way that if you just like do a wine kit, like an inexpensive wine kit, you don't really achieve that level of complexity. It tastes like fermented grape juice. You really, a lot of times from wine kits, have to really spend to get a very complex kit made from great grapes. But adding that buckwheat honey to get a little bit of punch of nuance in there and that orange blossom honey to give it that, just the, like a little tropical breeze on the back end, good orange blossom honey, mind you, really makes for an excellent and pretty quick yeast pitch to glass kind of product. I think I'm drinking this one at about four or five months of age. In our first batch of this, we only used orange blossom honey and didn't use that buckwheat. But I really do think that kind of syrupy, molassesy, funky kind of character and that very small amount of buckwheat honey that we used in this is really 
kind of the make or break element in here. When it's just Orange Blossom and Merlot, it's a little bit one note. Quite lovely. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We've got another Piment video coming out sometime, hopefully before the end of the year. We've been working on a Riesling Piment recipe. Hopefully that will come to you soon. As always, thank you for subscribing. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe and hit that notification button because we do a lot of homebrewing content here on the channel. And you can follow us on all the social medias. And most importantly, join our Discord server. Lots of brilliant brewers in our Discord server, ready to help. Until next time, happy brewing, happy vintning, vintning, vintning. And uh, cheers. <laughs>